Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Dental XP, for having me. And I was particularly humbled this morning to see the quality of the presentations. Um, not only were they of an incredibly high academic value, but also the quality of their moral um, integrity is just incredible. So I'm, I'm very humbled to be a part of this incredible panel and group. Uh, excited because I hear there are people representing over 30 countries today. This is huge. This is the UN in so many ways. I mean, th there's not too many meetings around the globe that has, have this, this tremendous impact. As David mentioned, I, I did my training at the University of Washington, and, and for sure this was, in so many ways, a life-changing experience um, to me. And during the presentations, I will acknowledge uh, many of my mentors that clearly um, were the ones responsible for me being able to do what, what I do today. But in fairness, I don't do anything by myself. When I was done from the UW, I came back to Mexico. And one thing you probably don't know about Mexico and Mexico City, Mexico City is the one city in the world that has the largest amount of U.S. trained prosthodontists. Probably close to 80 U.S. trained prosthodontists. And a ton of U.S. trained periodontists, a ton of U.S. trained endodontists. So when I came back, nobody was really waiting for me, you know, as patients, except my family, of course. Um, and so when I started practice, I pretty much had to start from scratch. This is here the, the building where I practice. And again, I have to give credit to uh, my phenomenal team that allows me to come and share some of the stuff we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So my topic today is interdisciplinary dynamics. And I say dynamics because it's changing continuously. And we, we have to understand it, uh, the nature of such uh, endeavor. So when you look at the different presentations that you've been exposed to these two days, different takes on what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. The reality is that as I see and I s scan the room, uh, are incredible uh, clinicians from all over, but the reality is we see things differently and we apply them differently. So what I want to do in the course of the next uh, 37 minutes is to give you my take or our take on how to communicate. Take a look at these images, and of course the communication here was between a restorative dentist and a technician. When you look at this uh, case here, the communication was broader. It was not only a technician, but it was the product of communicating to a broader team. We had uh, a restorative team, we had surgeons involved, an implant surgeon. We had a laboratory as well. And so you can start to see that while this uh, clinical situation is complex, and it's complex because it entitles more than one stage, it's still pretty straightforward. If we start adding specialists, and you see this case here, you see again. I mean, it's the management of a congenitally missing lateral. And this is something that probably 90% of this audience does on a day-to-day -day basis. But again, I think we're, we're here adding layers of complexity. And the reason why we're adding layers of complexity is because of the amount of people that are involved in a case like this. So, you know, how many appointments, how many specialists, how many mindsets? But I guess the one question that I'd like to address is how many misunderstandings? How many potential misunderstandings among the people that treat these type of patients? I have a lot of misunderstandings with my team. I'd like to say I don't, but I'd be lying to you. And my responsibility as an educator is to hopefully shed some light and share how, how it is that we try to minimize such misunderstandings. So with that in mind, I'd like to ask you to think about what is your pain when it comes to communicating, when it comes to treating patients with your team? Because my assumption is you do have a team, probably even uh, a pain. Even probably Team Atlanta has a pain or has had pain, right? So I truly believe that the toughest pain, and I'm going to step down, is communication. 
In communication, I was talking to my buddy, Carlo Poggio, who's a phenomenal clinician. He says, communication doesn't exist. It's an illusion, right? And so how often do we embrace the fact that communicating is an illusion and the complexity of such illusion? You know, it's interesting. Lately, I've, I've been diving into um, the marketing world, and I bumped into a concept that is pretty fascinating. Most likely, many of you here have not heard of it. It's called the buyer's journey. Some people talk about the consumer's journey. This is the buyer's journey. And in marketing, this is something people use all the time. Now, I want you to take a good look at what it says over there. Three steps as a buyer's journey. The first step, and it's mandatory that you follow these steps. The first step is awareness. Awareness of a problem. That's the only way you can then go to the next stage, which is consideration. You consider a solution or multiple solutions, which takes you to the final stage, which is the decision. You see, OK, this is the product or service I want to purchase. You know, as I was looking at this concept, I must confess, I became almost paralyzed. Why? Because these three stages are the exact same stages that we do when we treatment plan. So conceptually, we treatment plan utilizing marketing strategies. We have an awareness stage of a problem. We have a consideration stage of which is the best solution for a given patient. And then we decide where to go. Now, if you think about it, why is it adding layers of complexity? And the key lies within the awareness stage. We have different sense of awareness. If you are a periodontist, if you are an oral surgeon, if you are a prosthodontist, if you are a restorative dentist, you try to incorporate each and every one's awareness into the mix. It cannot be simple. So you have to take it, you know, one step at a time so that you can then consider the potential solutions and eventually bring it to the end. You know, um, and actually, as I dug in deep into this, I realized treatment planning truly is a buyer's journey. And I wrote a piece that was just published last week. And for, for, for lack of a better reference, I'm going to give you a pretty universal reference. If you want to look at this article, just Google it. <laughs> Put Ricardo Mitani, Treatment Planning, Buyer's Journey, and you'll, you'll, get, you'll load it immediately. And you can see the subtle uh, uh, similarities that exist between the marketing world and our particular treatment planning world. So that being said, we realize that dentistry can truly be life-changing. We do change patients' lives. We're able to provide incredible solutions. But we also have to realize that we're living in the era of the quick fix, the instant gratification. And by this means, with the cell phone, you buy anything you want, you access to information. I just gave you a quotation. Right now, you could probably be downloading that article and reading it. Quick gratification. So patients want quick gratification. They want the implants now. They want the veneers now. The reality is we're also living in the world of the fast and furious. And I'm not talking about the movies with cars. I'm talking about patients. You give a patient you know, a fast, a quick fix, and some of these patients end up being furious because you mess them up. Not you, our colleagues that don't embrace this notion. So we should be in the business of providing long-term, uh, stable, aesthetic results. The problem with the extreme makeovers that we see every so often is that we don't see what happens to those patients down the road. So with that in mind, and I realize, and I love Carlo Poggio's concept of, we talk about minimally invasive, minimally invasive. We talk about interdisciplinary. These are terms that we use so vaguely. And uh, I question if we truly embrace them and we truly you know, um, act consistently clinically 
by those terms. So at the end of the day, this is a term that is not even a dental term. Less is more. It comes from the architectural world. So the least, the least amount of dentistry that we do is, will always be better off. I was talking to Professor Homasade a while ago. He was talking about predictable. How, do, how can we predictably treat periimplantitis? So probably the, the most predictable approach to avoid having periimplantitis is, is not placing an implant. At the end of the day, we have to play a conservative game. And we do implants every day, but we have to realize and truly question if we can get away with doing dentistry and delaying the implant. So you take a look at these two images. And you go through pattern recognition mode. Many of you will see that, of course, these two patients are the same patient. Now, one thing that I need to pause for a second and do, and this is something that I've always seen the Salama brothers do, is pay allegiance to their mentors. And today, I want to talk about, really about these two gentlemen who unfortunately passed away, Dr. Ralph Udalis, Dr. Vince Kokic, who instilled in me these so-called patterns that I recognize and I see consistently in my patients and that truly allow me to treat patients in an interdisciplinary fashion. For those younger guys in the audience, that block with some squares are called slides. We used to take those pictures uh, before the digital age. By the way, another word that's going to be pounding, or it's been pounding every single uh, presentation is digital. Um, and again, uh, an, incredible, an incredible opportunity to, to uh, um, upgrade what we, what we learn how to do analogically. So when you look at pattern recognition, and again, it's, it depends on how you set your mode into, you realize that you start seeing the possibility of interdisciplinary care all over the place. So this chart here is pretty much the framework of the way that I try to communicate with the specialists that I work with, particularly the orthodontists. And um, this is kind of like the backbone that I utilize. So on the one hand, we have conventional ortho, which is those patients that we refer for the orthodontist to take care of those patients. And, and then I, had, I don't have much to do about it from a restorative end. They deal with dental facial orthopedics, alignment, occlusion, and then there's either no missing teeth nor no tooth size discrepancy. On the other hand, we have adjunctive ortho. And adjunctive ortho can be either site-specific or comprehensive. And we deal with alignment, we deal with space, we deal with tissue. So this comprises the backbone of what I intend as a prescription to provide the orthodontists and the surgeons that I work with because in many ways, as you can see, that tissue area, of course, overlaps with potential surgical corrections. So if you took a, take a look at this image and talk about space, okay, we have a crowding and we have a patient through her buyer's journey, she wants these teeth to look nice on her face even though she's 75. So ortho is out of the question. I got to look for an alternative. We remove one central incisor and we restore. Without ortho, in this particular case, we extract. So we consistently look for alternatives. And this, of course, is not minimally invasive, but it allowed me to provide a solution for this patient. So let's start with a simple, the simple diastema dilemma, ortho versus restorative. The reality is that we all have our checklists and what we look into to guide our thought or decision process. And all these different biometric identifiers play in our minds differently. But we realize that there's got to be correlation between them. And many you know, clinicians and teams have, have often dug in and studied, one of them, of course, being Team Atlanta. I mean, what is the correlation between these things? The other, of course, the group. Uh, you know, led by Dennis Tarnow and Steve Chu, we are still to find so many additional correlations of these biometric identifiers that we still don't have that, that clarity. Take a look at these two patients, and they think, think of that song of uh, John Cougar Mellencamp. These two patients are called Jack and Diane. Okay, so let's assume one of these two patients is going to go to the orthodontist because. The orthodontist can only take one. Which one would you refer, Jack or Diane? Again, a very broad audience. And you all see things differently. These correlations play differently in your minds. 
So if I may, I'd like to suggest three stages or three steps that allow you to decide which one is getting the ortho and which one can get away with the ortho, which have to do with the visible contour, which is the proportion, has to do with the arrangement, which is the composition, and of course has to do with occlusion or the anterior uh, component of the guidance. Now I'll come back to Jack and Diane for a second, but I'll just let you know that at the end of the day, perception is reality, and perception differs from the, one, the mind of one versus the other. And this is an article that came out, published by Vince Kokus Jr. while we were finishing at the University of Washington. It looked at the perception of different aesthetic parameters, right? And so realized that orthodontists, and the null hypothesis behind this article was the orthodontist is the one specialist that has the highest acuity, aesthetic acuity. Well, what they found was that perception is all over the place. There are some orthodontists, some restoring dentists, and some patients that have different perceptions. So this is why it's important for us to standardize and to try to communicate whatever we perceive in order to ensure that we avoid having misunderstandings. So we take a look at Monica's case here. She comes in, she wants to improve her smile. And we see we have some issues. We'd like to close that diastema for sure, but as we look at her comprehensively, we see that restoring her the way she is could definitely create some issues for us. And so, as we examine her clinically and radiographically, we have to realize that this has to be communicated in a way that the orthodontist understands what is it that I want restoratively to be able to provide the best solution for this particular patient. So we go through adjunctive ortho because I'm restorative. We go through alignment, and of course we have space issues, space concerns, both in an inter-arch and an intra-arch. So as I start communicating this with the team, now, the orthodontist can go in, set the stage for a very minimal approach from a restorative end. Okay? So once she's done with the ortho, we're able to now, again, communicate from clinical to the lab and back and forth. We draw some lines digitally. We transfer them analogically. And I know Christian has been here yesterday, and, and what an incredible impact Christian has had, you know, worldwide with, with something very similar to this, you know, drawing lines and transferring information that allows us as a tool to communicate better. So lo and behold, we end up doing a mock-up, and sure enough, this sets the stage for the, for the end result. So as you can see, we're dealing here with um, a very controlled environment in which the restorations that we're providing really don't call for much tooth reduction. So make her impressions, and by the way, I'm still doing most of my work is done, done analogically, although we're also starting with, with digital work right now. So we, are, we do our durolation records, we ensure that um, we transfer all that to the lab, we're increasing the vertical dimension slightly, but posteriorly, we're not gonna be doing any full coverage when we can avoid it. And, and again, I think Carlo nailed it in the head. I mean, we still do full coverage, but we really try to avoid. So whenever we can do tabletop restorations, we're gonna shoot for that. Okay, and this is lithium disilicate, this is uh, Emacs, and so we go back to the bonding stage. We've been utilizing same line, same protocol for many years. Now we're utilizing Viralink aesthetic um, products to, to be able to provide um, predictability clinically as well. So this is the clinical end result here with occlusal shots and close abuse. And um, I guess, once again, the most important aspect of truly uh, evaluating or assessing if, if um, the restorations are um, predict have a predictable outcome is, of course, the way they fit on the face. And I was not here yesterday, but my assumption is that Christian and others did a great job discussing, documenting this in a dynamic way. These pictures that we're, that we're showing here are, are not pictures based on fixed photography, but they are freeze framing of, of video. And of course, if you want to transfer information that's, uh, that has to do with lip dynamics, you cannot do it with, fixed, with a fixed concept. You have to utilize a dynamic tool, which is a video. So again, these are fixed images of, um, I mean, freeze frame images of um, of a video that we took from the patient, okay? So now as, as we go back and see Jack, 
Of course, he hates his smile. And when I tell him to smile, see how truly inaccurate this picture is. He doesn't go there naturally. He hates me taking that picture. So this shouldn't be the right tool to represent this because if we utilize this, sometimes we can get burned, particularly in those patients that we're going to be doing implants, and we don't know where the transition line is going to end up being. So again, you do video. Bottom line, though, with Jack, in spite of the fact that he has such you know, short-looking uh, teeth or, or um, undersized teeth, we go through the three steps here, and we're able to visually see the what if. What if we're able to give him the non-orthodontic approach? We transfer into the mock-up, the patient sees it, and so this becomes a very straightforward non-orthodontic case. Go ahead, do our preparations, and lo and behold, we're pretty much done restoratively for the upper arch, whereas for the lower arch, because of the spacing of the teeth, we would want, we're not doing the lower veneers until Jack does do some ortho because we need to set the stage for predictable restorations, right? So you can see we're done with the uppers, we haven't done the lowers yet. Now, when, when it's Diane's turn, you can see she wants the quick fix as well. Actually, she comes in looking for a second opinion because she's been treated right now. Look at those provisionals. And she, and she came to see me not because of the provisional. She came to see me because the dentist that was treating her was not listening to her. Go back to the buyer's journey, the awareness stage. She was not listened. She looked for somebody else. So while her main concern was the anterior portion of the mouth, we realized that we had to sit down and again increase her awareness because, yeah, we could do anything we want in the, restorative, in the, in the posterior portion, but one thing we know is that by looking at her teeth and by looking at the previously stated parameters, we literally cannot do anything for her if teeth are not placed in the right position. Look at the tremendously aggressive nature of treatment had we not align teeth the right way. So then Diane's case, of course, becomes a very straightforward orthodontic case. I'm starting with this simple cases because that's the only way we can then progress into the more complex situation. So sure enough, she wants to have her ceramic restorations. We do, again, very minimally uh, invasive preps for the veneers. We do a pickup for the posterior uh, restorations as well. And sure enough, this is the end result for Diane. So again, I cannot stress more the importance of this type of situations being able to do without the orthodontic component. And this, of course, is it's pretty straightforward. Now, we're talking about adjunctive ortho and managing spaces and tissue. I'll walk you through a few examples of things that, that, are, that I think, think that are relevant for us to keep in mind. Okay? So this patient, of course, is missing a central incisor, as you can see. Now, if we were to give him a quick fix, if we were to help him out you know, aesthetically, by means of a surgical, re surgical restorative intervention, you all realize the amount of aggressive dentistry that we need to do. Again, we have to see it, the patient has to see it to understand the implications of not doing so. So we go back and, and convert this patient into a complete denture patient, if you will. Block it out, draw some lines, draw additional lines. And by the way, I utilize an extremely sophisticated software, if you want to write it down, you may be able to find it. Um, it's called PowerPoint 2010. And so drawing these lines, we're able then to communicate with patients like this and take it to the next level. So if we were to prep these teeth and do crown lengthening to get things somewhat in a, in a, in a good space, you realize what it would entail for us to do. So of course, we'd like to open the, state, the space for an implant. Now, we go back to our chart and we realize we need to address the notion of creating space and also creating tissue in a horizontal component. So a patient goes, starts the ortho, and again, go back to the buyer's journey, awareness, 
but also has to do with the patient's compliance. Patient is very enthusiastic about the orthodontics. You can see how we've opened up the space. And lo and behold, and maybe this has happened to you before, patient disappears. Disappears for four years. Well, he doesn't quite disappear. I see him every three weeks, but not in the office. I see him because he, he's my hairdresser. So I have this constant fight with him. What the hell are you doing? You're not coming back to, the, to, to your dental meeting, the dental appointment. Anyhow, I finally get to convince him. He comes back four years after. This is what things look like, which wouldn't expect anything different, of course. But the bottom line is, um, the reason why I persuaded him to come back was because I was conducting a, uh, an implant course with my very good friend, Paulo Carvalho from Brazil, who flew to Mexico, and we're doing a course together. So I persuaded the patient to come back, as I said, you're going to have the opportunity you, you know, to, um, to have Dr. Carvalho place the implant on you. And for those of you that know, Paulo Carvalho is perhaps one of the top uh, periodontist surgeons, as far as I'm concerned, uh, out there. So that was my persuasive way of getting him to come in. Now, the space is not ready yet. Mesial distal space is not ready yet. However, we are able to place the implant. Again, we are able to identify which is the, sen the mesial distal center of that site, and we place the implant. Some CBCT imaging that allows us to see that the, the space is tight, but we could place the implant. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this case up, even though we haven't even finished yet, is because you guys have been exposed to orthodontic movement to create space. But there's some food for thought here. As I moved the teeth and as it took the patient four years to come back, take a look at what happened. See the very um, unfortunate ridge that we have. Very disappointing, extremely disappointing. Now, normally, we're so used to the interdisciplinary management of, let's say, congenitally missing laterals, in which we leave the canines, erupting the position of the laterals, and then move them distally. This is something we all do consistently. As I'm thinking, I'm, I'm, I'm really puzzled as to what happened here. I could think of two things that play an important role. The first one, of course, the time component. I think four years went by without any type of stimulation to that ridge, so there, there must have been some ridge atrophy. But secondly, the tooth which was the source of ridge creation was a lateral to create a central. So right there, we don't have the same ability to create a ridge as when we have a canine to open up a ridge for a lateral. So the size of the tooth, the prominence of the tooth, I believe plays a role. And so does the time. So anyhow, because of the ability of this tremendous surgeon, Paulo Carvalho is able to place the implant. Of course, we're not going to do through any type of immediate loading protocol. The implant goes in. Um, the site is um, grafted at the same time with um, BIOS collagen, a membrane. So here's part of the images that depict the surgery. We go back in. Um, four months later, and um, this is pretty much what things look like, so that we can now place a provisional and, of course, start resuming the ortho by means of an implant being the anchorage for the final portion of the orthodontics. So as much as we prefer going for screw retained in this particular situation, we realize that we didn't have a pick. We're going for cement retained, which is okay. And we should all do both and understand that both work, both screw retained and cement retained. Let's not get too crazy and being too radical. They both work, and we all need to understand both. So again, we do the uh, provisional. And as you can see, clearly the screw access hole looks buckle, but it also looks distal. And it looks distal because we are still needing to move and finalize the orthodontics, right? So the provisional goes in, we start our soft tissue grooming process, and we resume orthodontics. So looking like so, we obliterate this crew axis hole. 
we now place a bracket, which unfortunately is placed on top of that screw access hole. And as we open up the spaces now, we cannot unfortunately remove the tooth to, to add contours here, so we're adding it pretty much directly. So now we're in the process of fine tuning orthodontics. We can now extrude the other lateral, intrude the other one, and, and play around with gingival levels in a much more controlled environment. Okay? So these pictures were taken a couple of days ago, so this is where we're at right now. We'll be able to post the uh, file result hopefully soon. So anyhow, soft tissue management. Take a look at these two examples. I was giving a full day lecture yesterday to the Georgia Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry. Um, and it was a very interesting, incredible group. So we're talking about this. When you put your mind on pattern recognition mode, and you look at these two examples, you say, OK, what do these two patients have in common? They're both lower, yes? Type of the phenotype, the tissue looks alike. Right? And then you start looking at them, you realize another thing that they have in common is that they're what? Anyone? They're the same patient. Now, if they're the same patient, which is the before and which is the after? What type of implants do we have there? What type of abutments? What type of material? Is it zirconia? Is it Emax? The reality is that the abutment material there is dentin and cementum and a little bit of enamel. So what happened is that we moved those teeth into the position of the centrals. Now, a very interesting finding as you take a look at this image and you see the nice, or not so nice, but at least some type of a papilla growing between those two centrals. Now, of course, the reason why we did the ortho, going back to the buyer's journey, was not to get papilla. The reason why we went through ortho was to provide or, or to obtain the ability for us to be able to place implants in a single unit approach and provide the patient with a condition that's fairly simple to restore. So by doing this, a very nasty defect um, that we had in the anterior mandible now becomes the site of two natural teeth. And we're able now to place these implants in the lateral portion, ensuring the most predictable of all outcomes with implants, which is a single tooth environment. Now again, this orthotherapy, of course, is not for every patient, but I believe it's got to be sitting somewhere in your bag of tricks and you're able to provide the solution whenever you deem you know, convenient. So again, we make impressions for the upper arch, make drawlation records, and we fabricate the final restorations. So for a patient that does see value in having single units, this stretch of going through orthodontics really was worth the patient's effort. Okay. So again, not something that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, but we would probably, I'm assuming everybody here rathers, deal with a single tooth implant in teeth as opposed to having you know, implants in such a narrow condition where we know that the predictable nature of aesthetics in adjacent implants is, is it's very predictable. It doesn't look nice more often than not. So anyhow, here's where we're coming from. In, in the upper arch, we did some crown lengthening and some uh, connective tissue grafting as well. Okay, which leads to the next case. Um, and I have five minutes, six minutes to cover two uh, pretty um, involved patients. Most likely I'm just going to stick with one and call it a day so I don't take one minute away from the next speaker. So, so far we've been dealing with a patient that we moved teeth around where we had, you know, natural teeth in the way, so we had to move teeth. This last example we showed moving teeth around when we had a condition in which we had a defect. Let's take it to the next level. Yuri here 
had a very unfortunate alcohol-related um, accident. And he had some dental work done as a consequence of the, he lost, he lost one central. He had the implant placed in the crown. And this, of course, became almost a permanent scar of his accident. Every time he smiled, he would despise what he saw. So after a couple of years of him being restored, he came our way to see if we could help him out. Now, when you take a look at the implant that, that was placed, of course, it, it posed tremendous challenge to be able to help him out. So we put all the information that we have together and tried to figure out how could we help this poor patient. So the implant, of course, is placed um, for dimensionally pretty consistently. It has deficiencies, mesial distally, buccolingually, apicoronally, and angulation. So this is an implant that's going to be very tough to restore. It's going to be very tough to submerge as well. And we're also dealing with the problem associated with that lateral incisor, which has some type of a resorptive pattern as well. So again, as part of our buyer's journey, we present the patient. Of course, he's very aware of the problem. Now, he has to be aware of the potential solutions. So we present solutions. Option one, remove, removal of the implant, connective tissue graft, and a cantilever bridge off of the central. Second option, we do a three-unit bridge along with a cantilever graft, along with the uh, connective tissue graft as well. This is not the best option because we have this resorptive lesion on the lateral. So it's not the best option. Our next options, of course, have to do with placing the, removing the implant, placing an implant, and doing a cantilever bridge. And you could do it either placing the implant on the central or on the lateral, based on which would be the best site. However, we look at the patient's mindset, which just has to play an important role within such buyer's journey. This patient is an engineer, and you've all treated engineers. This patient will not want to hear about cantilevers. So if the patient is not getting a cantilever and wants us to help them out with implants, you all realize that we're facing probably one of the most challenging situations of all, which is, of course, the unilateral adjacent implant situation. And the reason why it's so challenging, it's, of course, because we have the comparison of the contralateral side which, where we do have gingival architecture that's commensurate to a natural approach. So matching that's going to be the true challenge. We discuss it at large, and we discuss the potential you know, um, enhancement that we can do by numerous means. And so we decide that we're going to be uh, you know, removing the uh, crown, putting some provisionals, and, and doing a block graft initially, and see where, we, where, where can we bring the tissue to a better stage. So this is right here, the condition that we're able to provide. And I'll tell you, I feel very comfortable with this solution as potentially staying there for a while, for some years. If he's happy at this stage, I would be happy with this potential solution. Talk to him, and of course, always showing where we're coming from, and he says, no, I want this. I want ideal. So we go back to square one. We start thinking about the size of the defect and the potential problems that we can face to get that to a better stage. So can we move teeth around and place the implant on the other central? Well, got to remember we have an anatomical structure there that's almost impossible to cross, which is the mid paddle suture. We could move it. But it's not the ideal situation. How about moving the lateral and then force erupting and creating the site for both? So sure enough, that's what we did. And I have one minute to show you how this was accomplished. We move the tooth into the side of the central, a slow orthodontic approach. Now we're doing it. We're moving a natural tooth okay, into a grafted area where we had an implant. So you can see a different condition here. So briefly, where we're coming from, where we're at, and we cannot say this more often. 
It takes seconds to destroy what, what it takes years to reconstruct. And unfortunately, many of us here are dealing with reconstruction of these type of patients that have, play, have been with implant placement or malplacement. So sure enough, this is what we accomplished with the ortho. We see the type of ridge that we're able to generate. And now we go in and we place the implants. And again, you can be very grateful to that little piece of tooth for what it's created for us. Anyhow, just to wrap it up, again, the surgery of, of Dr. Paolo Carvalho. Place the implant, we start grooming the soft tissues along with a connective tissue graft also placed on the site so that we could um, eventually, a few months afterwards, be able to provide our restoration. So basically taking it from here to here, and I guess um, more importantly to remember, while not ideal, to remember where we're coming from and the challenges that we had to get here. So because I don't want to take any time for the next speaker, I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, avoid sharing you the, the, the last case that I had, which again has to do with how to communicate um, and how to incorporate orthodontics uh, into our bag of tricks. And again, as restorative dentists, if you think ortho, you could manage some of, the, the, of your patients in a highly, highly predictable approach. With that, and once again, the Dental XP team, Maurice, Henry, Dave, Ronnie, everybody, this has been a true pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you all for having me.